To all the saints of God, I say good morning today. And I just want to reiterate the fact that I love to praise His holy name. And it's because of the fact that His name is holy that we're able to come here today and assemble and to offer up to God expressions of thanksgiving as we marvel over who He is, as we understand if He didn't bless you one more time, He's God anyhow. And so we serve a mighty God. We serve one who is greater than great. He's marvelous. He's magnificent. He's awesome. He's worthy to be praised. And the best praise that we can give him is a life that is consecrated or placed in his hands for his use. I want to just kind of... um, shape this message today by, first of all, saying that we have come to uh, the conclusion of another series, uh, the series entitled, uh, Let's Get Real. Let's Get Real. In other words, it's time to cease and desist from faking and shaking. It's time to go ahead and just, let's come clean before God, Uh, because guess what? God already knows. He knows your inner thoughts. He knows everything about you. As a matter of fact, he knows more about you than you know about yourself. So that little that you think you know about yourself, it's enough to understand that you are not all that before God. And so we said, let's get real. And then we begin to say some things about, you know, what shapes us as believers. We said that real believers, real Christians have an authenticity or a genuineness to their walk. See, you know, if there is anyone on this planet who can be trusted, it ought to be members of the body of Christ. If there's anyone who could say, my word is my bond, it just ought to be the Christian. So therefore, we have to get real. We need to understand that God uh, wants us to be put forth as that body of believers who's able to now be a witness to the community at large. The world would know that we are his disciples by the love we have one for another. And not a manufactured or trumped up kind of love. It's something that comes from inside. It's something uh, that helps me to value you and you to value me. Even in the midst of my mess ups, even though I don't get it all right, I can still value you as a human being, as a person, because I know that you are a work in progress just like me. Amen. God is not through with me yet. Amen. I'm not a human being. I'm a human becoming. But he's still fashioning me. He's still working on little old me. And if you haven't noticed, I got some issues. <laughs> I've got some issues. <laughs> just like you got some issues. But God is, he's greater Uh, than my issues. He's able to, even in the context and in the midst of those issues, still make a way for me. He can make a way for you. So it's time, uh, we said that, you know, something about real believers, uh, real Christians, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they make real sacrifices. They have counted the cost, and they understand what it means to be all in for Jesus. Woe unto us when we put our hand to the plow. Uh, to walk with the Lord and then look back and begin to reminisce and have a longing to go back uh, to the former life. No, the Christian uh, walk is a progressive walk. We're continuously moving toward a higher mark, a higher calling. So today I want to say that even as uh, we talked about on last Lord's Day that real Christians have real goals, that we make sure that we always keep the main thing the main thing. No longer must we uh, major on the minors, but we must prioritize our lives in such a way that Christ has the preeminence uh, uh, of our lives. In other words, he sits on the throne of your heart. And so today as we talk about, let's get real. When we talk about setting goals, what goals do you have in your life? In other words, what do you want to be when you grow up? (laughs) See, all of us are children of God. We have not reached the apex or the zenith of our maturity. What do you want to be when you grow up? 
Well, I believe when we talk about let's get real, the real believer, his ultimate goal is to become like Christ. Christian maturity has to be uh, the thing that we are pressing toward. Why? Because we want to make sure that heaven is our home. I, you know, I, you know my, 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 my driver's license said I, I reside in the state of Indiana. But when you were baptized into Christ, you got another card. You got another piece of ID. And that piece of ID does not say that you live in Indiana. It says that your citizenship is in heaven. You... <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about heaven today. Is that all right? Someone said, I never, I've never been to Paris. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Here we go. I don't want to get into all that. <laughs> but if I can make it to heaven, that will be all right with me. Right, Why? Because heaven is the place that I want to be. Amen. How many of you want to go there? Right. How many? I don't see any hands. That's a shame. Amen. Church full of folk call, call themselves Christian. Don't nobody want to go to heaven. Oh, don't you want to go to that land? <laughs> don't you want to go to that land where I'm bound? And so it is that view in mind that gives us the wherewithal to endure hardships. Why is it that, you know, we, 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 we suffer persecution and uh, being looked at uh, in a strange kind of way, and, and we endure that? What is it? That makes the believer keep on keeping on. Well, it'll be much easier. It'll be much easier if we turn back and just walk the way everybody else walked. But what is it that causes us uh, to endure the cross? I maintain today that it is the view, the view of your heavenly reward. It is the view and the anticipation of being uh, with your heavenly Father that causes us, that, that strengthens us when everyone else seems to buckle under the pressure. It strengthens us to keep on keeping on. Why? Because we understand that there is a reward greater than anything that can be held against us. And nothing will keep our hearts and minds spiritually grounded more than looking for the coming of Christ. You see, it is the coming of Christ that uh, must occupy our time and attention. It is the fact that Jesus says, I'm coming back again, that causes us to look up in our heart. We look upward with great anticipation of him who went uh, to be uh, by the side of the Father, who is now making intercession for us. It is him who says, uh, I'm going away uh, to prepare a place for you. And he said, and if I go away to prepare a place for you, you can rest assured that I'm coming back again. But when I come back, I'm coming back to get you, to take you into that prepared place. Now it's your job to make sure that you are becoming a prepared people for that prepared place because he's coming back again. And so therefore, today we want to really focus in on the fact that he's coming back again. And when he comes back, will you be ready? Will you be ready to meet him in the clouds? The more we focus on our heavenly home, the more effective we become in our everyday Christian walk. Did you understand that? The more you're focusing on your heaven, when was the last time you just sit back and just cry tears in, in, of joy, just thinking about heaven, thinking about uh, being with the Lord, thinking about, you know, just how sweet it's going to be to worship him, to praise him, to just be in his presence all eternity. I believe it's that lofty thought that helps us to become overcomers in this world. We need to sometimes just think about heaven. Think about your, uh, in the final roundup of human affairs, when, when, when God shuts this whole thing down, we'll be with him. So the purpose of this lesson is that our anticipation, our anticipation of heaven becomes so strong that it transforms our living Resulting in Christ-likeness, knowing what examples to follow and knowing what examples not to follow. Yes, sometimes we can follow the wrong example. 
while we're striving to become an example. So it's really about our Christian walk today, folks. It's about your Christian walk. Following the right example. Striving to become an example for others. And so I want to say, watch your step. Watch your st- In other words, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. There's a lot of pitfalls out there, folks. There are a lot of minefields out there that Satan has put booby traps and landmines all over the place. And many times we step on them, don't we? We step on them. And sometimes we can come back and we can repent and we can be all right. But sometimes you step on the wrong minefield, it'll blow your leg off. It will maim you. It will cripple you. Sometimes we allow Satan to, to cripple us and stifle our effectiveness as a soldier on the battlefield. So you got to be careful how you will watch your step because Satan is there uh, uh, like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour, and he will eat you alive if you're not fortified with the whole armor of God. And the best way to make sure that you, you, you're always clothed in the righteousness of Christ is to have heaven as your goal. Always looking to the hill from which cometh your help. So therefore, it is our anticipation of our glorification that helps us to live, to live your today in view of your tomorrow. You got to live your today in view of Your tomorrow, for every decision that you make today will have consequences uh, in your future. Now, in our text, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 as we round out this chapter. Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 17, through and including verse 21 and maybe even to verse 1 of chapter 4. To get a contextual setting, again, we've been looking at Paul's perspectives of his life. As he's been looking at his life, he gives a personal testimony. And I said there's power in a testimony. There's power if you can tell people how God has changed your life. Uh, Better still, if people can see how God has changed your life, then they'll listen to what you have to say. Maybe, Maybe that's why a lot of times people don't listen to what we have to say because they don't see the transformation in our lives. Think about that. Don't even respond to that. Just chew on that later on. And then call me and say, Brother Mary, whether you was right. Notice in verse 17 of this text, the Bible says, He says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. Now, we understand that... um, Following after the proper example means everything. He says, join in following my example. Now, we have to understand, first of all, as we go into this text, that in terms of the standard for righteousness, if you want to follow anyone, you have to understand that that Christ is the standard. Christ is the standard. That's why we understand uh, the Apostle Paul says, even in chapter 2 and verse 5, he says, have this mind, have this attitude in yourself, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. You see, you have to think like him. You need to make sure you begin to think like him in order to uh, walk like him and, and talk like him and to become like him. He is the standard. He is the model. If you want to be mature, if you want to know how you ought to walk, you, a mature walk is walking in the footprints of Jesus. And so, therefore, he says, uh, join in following uh, this example, the very example that we've modeled before you, knowing that we have been modeling by the grace of God after Jesus Christ. You see, Christian character, Christian character has to be our goal. Why are you here today? What's your goal? What is the what is the what is the outcome? What is the positive outcome? What do you want to get out of your experience here today?
Is it that, you know, I've satisfied the man-made standards of righteousness. I've come to this and I've come to that. What are you seeking? What do you want to get out of this? See, when you know what you want to get out of it, then you know what you must put into it. Is that all right? See, the Apostle Paul said, I want to be more like Jesus. So I'm going to give my all in all. I'm emptying myself of myself. And so therefore, when he has this uh, flashback and he gives his a chronicle of his life, he moves from three different places. We've already talked about two. First of all, in viewing his past, he puts on his accounting head, right? And he says, I count it all loss. As he begins to look in his past and begins to, to talk about all the things that, uh, uh, in his humanness, those things that brought him prestige, honor, influence, a, a, a time or an occasion to boast. And then he begins to look at that in comparison to what it means to follow Jesus. He says, I count all of that as loss. That's what my past was about. Yeah. And then on last Lord's Day, we said he took off his accounting hat and he put on his running shoes. And he used the metaphor of an athlete. He says, now I press. Just like one who's running and he's pressing for the finish line. And he's straining to, 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 win, to win the prize. And he's stretching and he's straining to get to, and that's what it is, to really to apprehend Christ. I'm giving him my all. Every fiber of your spiritual being, I'm, I'm stretching Amen. to become more like him because he is the prize. Amen. The kingdom of heaven has to be the prize. And he understood that he had to, to press on. I'm not there yet. I have not attained, but I'm pressing, I'm straining, I'm exhausting every, every ounce of my spiritual being to be like Jesus. So today, after he now has occasion to shed his athlete's shoes, and now he checks his ID, and he now says, I am an alien. <laughs> From accountant to athlete, now he says, I'm an alien. And when he says, I'm an alien, he's simply saying that I may be right here, but I'm looking over there. <laughs> See, my home is not right here. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm right here, but my heart's longing is over there, over yonder, on the other side, where Jesus is. He said, I want to go there. And even as long as I'm here, I realize that I, I, you know, I'm not comfortable here. This is not my home. Do you not know that the Christian, uh, the church, the believer, uh, we make up a, a colony, a colony of heaven here on earth. Amen. This world is not our home. So we dare not become a conform to the ways uh, of this world. Because this, so your citizenship, you're an alien, you're a foreigner. Your citizenship is in heaven. And so he says, I look. I look. Over yonder. Now, and therefore, our goal, our all-consuming quest in life is to grow in Christ-likeness, to become mature in Christ, to become complete in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, my preaching and my teaching and all those things I'll do uh, was for the purpose of presenting you as mature in Christ Jesus. Every Bible study, every, every message, every Bible study, every fellowship, every gathering, everything that we do has to be for the purpose of maturing us a little bit more, making us long for that heavenly goal a little bit more, to want to be a little, get a closer glimpse of Jesus just a little bit more. And then the more you rub shoulders with Jesus, the more folk will want to rub shoulders with you. It's something... It's something about being transformed into the image of our God, to be transformed into the image of Christ. Because the more time you spend with him, the more you start to think like him. The more the time you spend with him, the more uh, the things that would upset him are to upset you. Right. When was the last time you looked at the scene in your own life and became sorrowful? When was the last time you began to consider uh, areas in your life where you've been weak? 
and it caused you uh, to mourn and to anguish in your soul. And if you can say that I'm always in a state of mourning over my sinfulness, that just reveals the fact that you've been spending some time focusing on Jesus. If you can go through life and sin all around you, unaffected, un- undaunted, it just means that you need to spend a little bit more time with Jesus. It has nothing to do with the fact that you go to church. It has everything to do about your inner sanctuary time. When you're able to go into that hidden place with you and God alone on a regular and begin to spend time with him. And for everybody who comes to Wednesday night Bible class, that's a hint, hint, clue, clue to get your homework together. <laughs> Amen. And so notice the Christian character has to be our goal, right? Maturity in Christ and completion in him has to be uh, what I pursue, which results in stability in Christ. When you're stable in Christ, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that you're not tossed to and fro by every wind of teaching. See, sometimes we get so, uh, our foundation is, is not secure. It becomes so weak that, that we can get tossed to and fro. Someone says this and we're over there and they say that and we're over there and, and we, we don't know whether we're going or coming. Because you don't heard some new teaching. Uh, and you don't have the spiritual discernment uh, to, to understand if that is from God or from man. You see, spiritual stability allows you to be stable, anchored uh, in the Word. Fully, fully equipped in Christ, which comes from me putting on the whole armor of God. I want to give you a hint, hint, clue, clue on this. You know, we, this, this struggle that we have. This battle, this war that is raging, it's not an earthly thing. So the Bible says we wrestle not with flesh, uh, flesh and blood. We have to understand that in every situation there is spiritual warfare going on. Yeah, I may look at brother so-and-so and I might not like him today because he said something yesterday that didn't, that didn't sit right with me and, and I kind of stepped on his toes and he didn't want to hear that and I didn't want to hear that either. And then I'm looking at him like this. He said he ain't seen me. He walk on by. <laughs> All that kind of immature stuff, right? We play those games, right? Games people play. We play that game. But it, when I learned that it's not Brother Jared. It ain't Brother Jared. See, sometimes we, we, we play certain, we fight certain battles on the physical, but the real warfare is going on in the spiritual. And you can't, you can't uh, discern that if you were walking around in your own carnality, in your own, you know, humanness. So therefore, we need to make sure that the mature walk is a circumspect walk. In other words, it's a vigilant walk. In other words, it's a walk where we're constantly watching, understanding, and perceiving what's going on around us. You see, when you become fully equipped in Christ by putting on the whole armor of God, it results in you being a fully functional and devoted follower of Jesus Christ. Mature Christianity uh, uh, must be our example. Excuse me, mature Christians must be our example. Notice back in the text what the Apostle Paul says. He says, be followers together of me and mark them and mark them which walk uh, as an example. My instruction or my encouragement, uh, my uh, admonition to all of us is to seek out godly examples. You know, well, Brother Mary, I don't see any godly examples. Looking right at me. I don't see any godly examples. <laughs> then you be one. I don't play that. Then you be one. Yeah, well, I see my Brother Murphy over there, and he ain't this. And Brother Johnson uh, over there, he's not this. And, and, and brother, brother, brother Wilson, he ain't this. Well, Brother Mary, whether you ain't really. Honest. Well, you be one. You be one. I ain't got time for that. Man, I need to learn from you. We're all in this thing together. But the point is, we need to understand that every Christian's ambition here on earth should be to live a life worthy of imitation. Every last one of us, our goal is to to live a life in such a way that folks will say, I want to be like Shipley. I want to be like that because I see something in him. I see the God in him. I see the Christ likeness in him. And I want to be like that. Every one of us, man and, and woman, 
That's why the Bible says that you, you know, the older sisters ought to be spending time and grooming and cultivating godly characters in younger women. Amen. Don't just talk about it because they dress too short. You start a relationship with them. They give you some, some, some capital to invest, some relationship capital. You can invest in them, and then you can put, child, you may want to deal with that hymn line. But make sure your hymn line is in order. <laughs> and so, so therefore, modeling the character of Christ Jesus, and, and therefore drawing all men unto him. That's why the Bible says uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, and verse 6 and 7, uh, the Apostle Paul, he, in verse 2, he says, you know, you know I, I thank God uh, uh, always in every remembrance of you, giving thanks uh, because of your, your work of faith and your labor of love. He said, you followed our example, and now there's no need for me to say anything because your message uh, has sounded not only in Thessalonica and Achaia, but all over. In other words, your, 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 your message have sounded louder than your message. In other words, it's because of your, your works of faith, your labors of love, that everyone now is giving you ear, and they want to hear what you got to say. I'm trying to, trying to tell you that when you walk a mature walk, uh, you're able to recognize who you ought to follow, but you also recognize who you ought to avoid. Amen. Amen. Anyway, because a mature walk uh, is also a watchful walk. It's a watchful walk. That's why he says, uh, for many walk, stay with me now, verse 18. He said, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. They are the enemies of the cross. Now, he's not talking about somebody down the street. He's, he's talking about folk right up in here. Let's get it straight. Stay with me while I pray on this part. We have to flee from the enemy. Amen. We have to flee from the enemy. But how can you flee from the enemy if you can't recognize who the enemy is? See, sometimes, you know, all the glitters, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm use some bad grammar, but all the glitters ain't gold. Understand that sometimes you have to use and, 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 and cultivate spiritual discernment to understand uh, what kind of examples uh, to follow, but also what kind of examples to avoid. Right. Now, the reason why this is such a a, 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 a work of the Holy Spirit's discernment in your life. Because there may be some good things about me that you want to follow, but there may be some other things about me you don't want to follow. You see what I mean? So everyone has areas of strength and then areas of weakness. None of us can stand here picture perfect. Amen. Notice, he says, um, the enemies of the cross. So he helps us to understand the dangers, opposition uh, in groups, even in the church. In every church, uh, there always are some factions that can become dangerous opposition to the direction uh, and the vision of that church. And it may come out as very innocent and subtle in the beginning. Well, we just want to, we just want to do this. You know, and I know the churches, we're going this way, but, you know, I, you know we, we, we kind of like this group. But we are... Notice, those uh, dangerous oppositions in the time of the Apostle Paul reared his ugly head in two different ways. First, there were those who were called the antinomians. And that is simply uh, uh, those who say they were anti-law. They were above the law. This is that group they called, it was come out of a philosophy called Gnosticism. And there were different sects of Gnosticism. 
There's a plethora of, of different expressions of, of Gnosticism. Gnosticism simply means those who thought they had all knowledge. Okay? And they were causing folk to separate themselves from the truth of God's word. And they were saying that, you know, uh, we have attained certain knowledge. And because we've attained this certain knowledge that we are uh, above everyone else. And we don't have to do this, or we don't have to do that, or we don't have to get with the program. We're above. It's kind of like uh, another group called the Libertines. The Libertines were those who said, you know, they were above the law. And they wanted to just indulge in all kind of fleshly uh, exploits. Remember over there in the book of, uh, what was that book? In Romans chapter 5. <laughs> They will begin to conclude that if we, if we sin a lot, we can just sin so much, we can just burn the sin out of us. So let's just sin. Let's do it. Let's do this. <laughs> Until we just extinguish all this, we lose the appetite. And because if we sin a whole lot, guess what? There's a whole lot of grace. How many of you want a lot of grace? Raise your hand. Amen. I want a lot of grace. That means we can do a lot of what? <laughs> I'm going to make sure you guys don't fall asleep. That's why, that's why Apostle Paul said in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 6 and uh, verse 1, he said, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He said, Don't even go there. <laughs> but not only do we see it uh, in those who thought they were above the law, but then on the other side of the spectrum, there was another group. Um, who said uh, you have to dot every I and cross every T. And they begin to uh, attain to their righteousness by their works. We call them the legalists. Those legalists were those who said, you know, I'm righteous because I've done this, based on my own human effort. You see, uh, everything that is about a human achievement. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul, before he encountered Jesus, he was that kind of guy. He was a Pharisee. You know, he was a strict adherent to the law. He was the one who thought that he was right before God just because of his performance, his, based on his ability to achieve, based on his humanness, leaving no room for God. Both of those are dangerous oppositions. You see, he begins to uh, give a passionate plea. Notice what he says when he begins to talk about those folk. He still loved them. You see, some of you guys raising all kind of in the church. God says, I still love you. So when folks start turning up to church, don't you just, just start hating on them. God still loves them. And you have to love them as well. Don't put up with that, but you still have to love them. You know? Because you may be in another area of your life in that same camp. Notice the disastrous, disastrous consequences for those who begin to live uh, that way. Notice what he says in verse number 17 and, uh, 18 and 19. He says, whose end, what, is destruction. In other words, he, he, he pleads because of the doom they face. Their end is destruction. Uh, it's just like a man who uh, built his house upon sand and then uh, because he was not anchored in Christ. And when time came for that testing of that house, the Bible says it was ruined and great was the destruction of that house. Great and final is the destruction of that house. When judgment comes uh, and you have not built your house on the right foundation, which is Christ, uh, there's going to be some destruction. Great and final will be that destruction. So therefore, the doom they face is destruction. But not only that, we look at the deity. The deity they serve. The Bible says that their, their God was what? Their own stomach. The God was their stomach. In other words, personal satisfaction. They, was, they served the God of, of pleasure, the God of personal satisfaction, the God of uh, uh, immediate gratification, the God of, 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 of physical desires. That was the God that they served. They wanted whatever can please and arouse the flesh. 
whatever excites you, whatever hits your jones, whatever really gets your, puts your button, whatever arouses you. I, you know, you want that, don't you? Yes, y'all do. Yes, y'all do. You know, the flesh, the flesh is, is bad. <laughs> I mean, flesh is tough. I had to give it to the flesh. I'm talking about no, y'all just know the political correct thing to say. When you were a little baby and your diaper was cha- needed to be changed, you start crying. Uh-huh. And then mom came and gave you some, some oil, you know, gave you some powder, and rubbed you down, and, you know, put a clean diaper on you, felt fresh and good and clean. You said, oh, I like this. And then a couple hours later, you did it again. <laughs> and here she, mom, come over here. She changed you, wash you up, put that lotion on you again, powder, put a new diaper on you, you know, walked you around and all that kind of stuff. And you started getting used to that, didn't you? Do you remember that? You start crying again. Nothing wrong. You just cry again. Pick me up. Give me a bottle. Where's my rattle? <laughs> so don't say you don't like the flesh. You like it. Whatever makes you feel good. I do too. Whatever makes you feel good, what, you know, but, but then it can become unhealthy. See, those things that make you feel good um, are not sinful in and of themselves. You see, we all have legitimate needs, don't we? But see, sometimes, see, the, 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 the danger is Satan wants to trick you into fulfilling a legitimate need in an ill, legitimate way. See, he wants to, he has, has a legitimate need. The baby needs his diaper change. But see, now we start throwing tantrums and fits and all that, falling all out at Walmart. I'm telling on myself, can I get a witness? Can I get an amen? They're embarrassing me. Yeah, I'm going to deal with you right now, but when I get you home. It leads to, he, he looks at the disgrace, the disgrace that they bear. You see, they find themselves boasting in shameful things, right. boasting in sinful things. Remember over there in, in, in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, uh, uh, they were boasting in, 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 in things that ought to bring them shame. Uh, they begin to boast in the very thing that the world would cringe at, the world who's living footloose and fancy free. When they begin to find out what some of the Christians were doing, woo, I, that made them blush, made them embarrassed. Now, how in the world can we be a, a, a draw to the world when we're trying to out them? How can we be a critique against the world? How can we begin to present ourselves as light uh, in a dark place when our activity is shrouded in darkness? But you see, when you are thinking about heaven, when you think about the return of Jesus, and, and you long for that relationship to be rekindled and restored, That'll keep you from going off on the deep end. It'll keep you barren. It'll keep you centered and anchored in Christ Jesus. He said their disposition, uh, they display uh, their obsession with earthly things. Craving the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. You see, the mature Christian uh, must be one who can discern truth from error. The mature Christian must be one who can discern spiritual believers from carnal believers, those who would cripple the church rather than care for the church. We must be able to recognize those disastrous traits even when we find those traits in ourselves. One thing for me to try to look at you and see all the wrong in you, I better look at myself. We better look at ourselves, church. We can say, well, there's them out there, they're doing this and they're doing that. What are you doing? Better still, what are you not doing? How come you don't get, uh, you're not mourning over the sin of your life and the sin of the life of others? Perhaps we haven't spent enough time with Jesus. Finally, let me just share this with you. Not only is uh, this Christian walk a mature walk and a watchful walk, but finally, it is a completed walk. Now, what am I saying? Again, we're still looking in the future. We're still looking forward. We're looking at Christ as our example. We're looking at the, the parasea, 
The parousia simply means uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're, we're looking for that time when he comes back. And because of that, uh, again, I stated earlier, uh, when you have a positive view of your tomorrow, it's going to determine how you walk today. Amen. Knowing that your steps you take today are getting you one close, step closer to your tomorrow. In other words, whatever we do, we do in view of our relationship with Jesus. We do it in view of the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so notice what the Bible says in verse 19, uh, uh, verse 20. Uh, now he says, he says, for our conversation. Some versions will say, for our citizenship is in heaven. Now, from, from whence also we look, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. See, we have to focus on the expectation. We have to focus on the expectation. The expectation is not for me to hurry and get out of here and beat somebody else over to Golden Corral. That's not the expectation. No, no, no. The expectation is the return of Jesus. The expectation is, 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 is glory in heaven. The expectation is me being with him. In other words, uh, my heavenly home, our citizenship is in heaven. We are just an outpost. We're just a colony. We're a rebel tribe who, who, who's in this world, but we're not like this world. When I came back to Indiana, you know, it took a little getting used to. It took, it did. It took me a little getting used to being back home, you know. And a couple of months ago, I went back out to L.A., right? I rented a car. I'm going to tell you this. I ain't scared to tell you. I rented a car, and I got in. I started driving. I was going the wrong direction. I said, wait a minute. I know this spot. And, I, and then I got on the freeway, and I, was, and I, get, boom, 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 boom. And I, was, I used to roll, right? And then I'm getting like, you know, I ain't getting a little paranoid. Yeah, I was getting paranoid. Hold on to the wheel all tight. You know? <laughs> I told my wife about it. I said, wait. <laughs> it wasn't until a couple of more days, you know, out there driving, I started getting real comfortable again. See, that's how you ought to feel in this world because you're away from home. You see, you want to get back to the Father. You want to get back to the Father. And every, every day that you're here, you're uncomfortable. You are an outcast. Notice, not only does he look at himself as an alien, uh, uh, away from his own citizenship. He said, we are strangers in this world of sin. Because in this world, sin is the norm. But sin must not be the norm for you. And so, therefore, you're not comfortable in and around sin. You ought not be comfortable with the sin in your own heart, the sins of your own life. That ought to make you uncomfortable. It ought to make you repent. It ought to make you sorry. It ought to make you want to, to do better and to be better. Why? Because I'm looking for the time where Jesus comes. I don't want him to catch me in the midst of my sin. I want him to see me ready to meet him. See, we're strangers. We're foreigners in a country uh, with sinful customs. It's customary. It's customary to live a life that appeals to the flesh. But we long a home with our Father. But Jesus says, I'm going to a pla prepare a place for you. And I want to make sure that I'm ready, I'm prepared for that prepared place. Why? Because we live. We live as though we are there. And therefore, we encourage others to join us and follow us to get there. If you were in heaven right now, what would you be doing? What would you be doing if you were in heaven right now? What would you be doing? Whatever you would be doing, you ought to start doing it now. Hello? Oh, yes. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to sing and shout. 
No one be able to put me all that kind of stuff. What you do that now? Because <laughs> we have a heavenly home, which means we have a heavenly hope. Notice what the text says. It says now, uh, because uh, we are uh, anticipating him, it says we eagerly, we eagerly await him. We eagerly await the glorious return of Christ. Not only do we eagerly await the glorious return of Christ, we eagerly await being fashioned in a glorified body, a new body. We know that we can't take this body with us. Matter of fact, we ought not want to. Why? Because we looking forward to that heavenly welcome where God will say to us, ah, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Enter into my rest. The Apostle Paul says, now we know. Now we know. That if this earthly tent, King James Version, if this earthly tabernacle uh, that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built with human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Church. It's all about your right now. You have to live your right now in view of your not yet. Do you hear that? You have to live your right now in view of your not yet. If you want to make heaven your home, and you're not a member of the body of Christ, well, understand all your good stuff, all your good deeds don't mean nothing. It's about your position in Christ Jesus. You need to get in Christ. Yes, you do. You need to understand that the gospel, the gospel message, is a message that helps you to understand the goodness and the love of God and the provisions that he's made for you. God loves you. He wants you to go with him. He wants you to be ready when he comes back. Jesus is coming back. He wants you to be ready. But how do you get ready? Well, First of all, you need to submit. You have to admit something, first of all. You need to admit uh, that you've sinned. You have not lived a life for him. And once you admit that, once you admit that, then you need to make a decision that you're going to turn your life around. Give your life to him. And, and let me give you a little heads up. None of us, none of us are there. We're all struggling and striving to be what he wants us to be. So don't start talking about, well, there's hypocrites over there in the church. That's why I'm not going over there. Well, there's hypocrites in your mirror. We all have hypocrisy. I stand before you right now as, as, as a person who has hypocrisy in his heart. You know, but I'm looking at one, one by the name of Jesus, the Christ, who gives me a model, and I'm striving to be like him. I'm not there yet. We are not there yet. But we are trying to live our today in view of our tomorrow. Amen. And we're asking you to join us by confessing that, yes, Jesus is indeed the Christ. He's the son of the living God. In other words, he is deity. He is God in the flesh. And I'm confessing him as Lord, and I'm willing to be buried in the watery grave. I'm willing to be baptized in Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. I want to wash away my sin. I want him to, to give me a new slate, make me new, so I can now begin to live a life in view of that heavenly calling.